Thank you very much. Oh, goodness me, I'm, ter I'm terrified, I'll be honest. I have done more public speaking than you can poke a stick at, but somehow this event is so tumultuous and enormous, and it's a very concentrated uh, audience of, you know, relatively intelligent people, and that's a challenge. Um, I have done a lot of uh, skeptics in the pub talks about electric cars, and I'm trying to do something a little bit different here today, because I know some of you have already seen me drone on and on about bloody electric cars. How bloody boring is that? Um, I, I just want to say that I'm, as I'm sure you're all aware, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a scientist. Uh, I was recently dubbed an, uh, uh, a technology advocate, and I've decided that's quite a good thing to be. Um, so I'm very interested in it, but I can't do it. Uh, I'm very good at watching uh, people make really clever things, as I've managed to earn a living doing for many years. Um, and electric cars are, I want to talk about them, what, they, what they kind of lead to as opposed to what they are. Now, obviously, uh, I think many, most of you are aware that they're, they're, we, we managed to blag a Tesla Model S to, to bring along to the thing here, and I know some people have had test drives of it, and it is a game-changing piece of technology. They are extraordinary vehicles. They still are cars. So they're still big things with wheels that go along the road, and they're cars, and they could create traffic jams, and they can create a lot of the things that cars create, except for tailpipe emissions. That's the, that's the thing that they don't do. But what I've discovered from having spent the last five years driving electric cars, talking about them, seeing them, testing, driving them all over the place, is that they kind of change our, they, they, they have the potential to change our relationship with cars, and more importantly, our understanding of energy. Because I, I, I used to drive proper petrol head cars. When I started doing Scrap Heap in 1998, I had a, an R32 Golf, Volkswagen Golf, with a ridiculously big engine that went very fast and was noisy and butch and the sort of car that footballers drive, and, uh, and a V8 Land Rover. So it wasn't exactly an eco garage that I had back then. Uh, by the end of uh, doing Scrap Heap Challenge, I had a, a Prius and a, a Mitsubishi iMeve, tiny little electric car. So something happened in that time, and that was really my experience of meeting a lot of engineers, particularly in America, who were working on the very early versions of electric vehicles, which led to things like Tesla. And it, I was fascinated by that, because I thought an electric car was a, a disability vehicle, a forklift truck, a, a milk float, and, until I went in one that went so fast that my bottom is still on a drag strip somewhere in Northern California. Um, uh, so, the, but the, the, the thing that I really want to talk about is how they came to be and what they represent. Um, uh, the, the Tesla Model S out there has lithium-ion batteries. They were developed in the 1970s in Oxford, uh, lithium-ion batteries, basically a little battery that you could recharge. Up to then, we had big lead-acid batteries or things like EverReady. I always remember having a big square EverReady batteries with a spring on the top that I would fix wires to to, to light my puppet theatre. Uh, this is when I was about 27. No, it was when I was very young. And, uh, and that's what a battery was, and they were basically rubbish. They didn't last very long. They were big and heavy, and they were, you, know, you knew they were full of toxic stuff, and you threw them away at the end of the day, and it was awful. And, you know, that, that's and so a particular uh, group of scientists in Oxford developed this thing that you could recharge. And it was small, and it held more electricity than the batteries we had. And it was a technological shift. I didn't know this was happening. This was in the mid-1970s. I was pogoing to the sex pistols at the time. And I, I had a lot of hair. So that's how long ago it was. Um, uh, and that really did make a difference. And as we all know, that, we can do it very briefly, but the history of mobile phones, I had a mate who was very wealthy in the late 1970s, who had a mobile phone. And it was just a joke. We all took the mickey out of him something rotten, because it had 10 minutes talk time. <laughs> 10 minutes. That's as long as you could talk on it. And it took about two and a half hours to charge, and it was the size of a house brick. And it was ridiculous, and he was a tosser. And he walked around with it, and it was just a joke. Who on earth is going to do that? You've got, I've got a phone, and you go like that, dial it up, and it's, and it's a wire, and it doesn't need batteries, and you can talk for hours. You know, why would you have 10-minute talk time? But that technological need developed smaller batteries that lasted longer, that could be recharged more often. And, you know, we can still complain about them now. <laughs> My latest smartphone, you know, when I go on the internet and take photographs and send video and do uh, constant online chatting, the battery doesn't last all day. So we are all tossers. Um, <laughs> and so that battery development uh, 
started to spread throughout other technologies. You know, we, we all know about it, tablets and laptops and everything, and it got better and smaller and lighter, and they lasted longer. And that was really where the development of the electric car came out of that, and it's interesting only in a, a very limited sense that uh, the, the latest generation of electric cars didn't come out of the automotive industry that is used to making big, lumpy engines that go... <laughs> And they go, electric cars, they're not, you know. So I'm not going to go into the whole boring politics of how they developed, but what was interesting was the electric vehicle that, was, that made people rethink the whole thing came out of Silicon Valley, not Detroit or, or, or in this country. Uh, it came out of computer engineers, because they understood how to manage batteries, they understood what batteries could do and couldn't do, and they understood how to uh, uh, operate uh, battery management systems, that is what makes that car uh, so extraordinary. Um, uh, and and the, that understanding of batteries then starts to spread. So what is happening now is there's a tremendous amount of investment and research going into, into battery technology. And, the, and, and it's impossible to keep up with, and I do try. And I've got one or two amazing PhD students that are working in, in, that, in that field that send me uh, PFDs that are like 80 pages long, and I can understand the title. In fact, some of the titles I can't understand, but they're very, very dense. But there is a lot going on, so I try and, uh, try and sort of filter it down to, to layman's terms. Because it is disruptive technology, in just the same way as the internet disrupted uh, the television industry that I've worked in. It, it has changed it. It disrupted the music industry far more. Uh, and electric vehicles are potentially an enormously disruptive technology. They will change things, not all for the better. I'm not a sort of, you know, if we all drive electric cars, the whole world would be wonderful and everybody would be happy and peaceful and equal and everything would be beautiful. That's bullshit. <laughs> uh, you know, but they do change the way we view energy, the way we use energy, where energy comes from, where it's stored, how it's used. All those things are thrown up in the air. Uh, one of the, I think, crucial experiences I've had in the last three years, I have a, a car called a Nissan Leaf and I have solar panels on the roof of my office. And in the last three years, I've now driven probably getting close to 10,000 miles out of a total of 40,000, 10,000 miles just on solar power. So that car didn't have any fuel imported, refined, transported to a pump, pumped up through a hose, put in a tank, burnt in the car to do 10,000 miles. I think that is a game changer. That has really set me on this path of understanding how this can be in implemented in, in a much wider way. Uh, you know, yes... There's a cost to the solar panels. Yes, there's an environmental cost to making the solar panels. Yes, there's an environmental cost of creating the car. All those things are there, but I've driven 10,000 miles without burning any fuel anywhere. And I think that is an extraordinary change. Um, so uh, uh, one of the things that's happening now is the, 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 the push towards grid-level storage. So we're not talking about a little battery in your phone or a battery in a car, which is much bigger, but a battery that would fill this room. In fact, much bigger than this room. Huge industrial-scale batteries. And why is there such a strong desire for that? And I think it's... I've talked to engineers at the National Grid. It is their absolute prim primary uh, uh, aim to develop this technology. And there's a huge amount of research going into it. Because if you think of how we make electricity now, we dig up coal and we transport it and we burn it in a power station, and that can run 24 hours a day, and it does all the things that we know there are problems with, but it's incredibly reliable, it's incredibly efficient, it produces vast amounts of electricity, we're all used to it, it's normal, that's how we do it. And now we're facing the fact that that really is causing a lot of other problems. And uh, we can also do it by burning gas, we can do it by burning nuclear fuel, all those things are tried and tested technologies. And then there's sort of new technologies being introduced, and they have huge drawbacks. Wind. Lots of people hate wind turbines. Lots of people will tell you wind turbines don't work. The big problem with wind turbines is they do work, and they produce too much electricity at the wrong time. They're very, very efficient at producing electricity. It's not me saying this. This is proper engineers who work, who are not involved in the wind industry, but are involved in, in grid distribution. They have real problems with massive spikes coming from wind turbines, and they don't know what to do with all the electricity. And if they could store it, that would be a brilliant way of solving that problem. At the moment, the only big way of storing large amounts of electricity is pumped storage, which I'm sure some of you are aware of. That's where you pump water up a mountain when electricity is cheap and you run it down when you, when you have a peak demand. So Dinorwig in Wales is the biggest pump storage uh, 
uh, uh, installation in this country. It is huge. I was there last year. It's an enormous uh, thing. It's built in the 1960s and 70s. And they can literally just f flick a switch and billions of gallons of water come out of the mountain, turn loads of big generators, create huge amounts of power, and supplement the spikes in demand that, that, uh, that exist. Um, that's, that's all we've got. And we've used all the mountains we can. We don't have them. Norway are very lucky. <laughs> they have an enormous amount of mountains and an enormous amount of pump storage. And Norway are really the only country in the world that are 100% powered by renewable energy, hydro, wind, and pump storage. So they do have that slight advantage uh, of have a small population and a very large lot of mountains. We don't have that. So we need other solutions. And there are brilliant ones. Um, the uh, Professor Michael Aziz at the Harvard School of Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences has uh, developed an organic mega flow battery. And I just like the term, the organic mega flow. I've got an organic mega flow battery. How big is yours? 50 billion gallons. Uh, and this is using organic substances, not rare metals. Rare metals are very expensive. The, the, the uh, idea of a, a mega flow battery is not new. This is where you mix two different fluids through a fuel cell in the middle, and that produces electricity, and exactly the same the other way around. You put electricity into the fuel cell, you split the liquid into two different units and store, store it. And uh, they're using, in fact, a, 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 a quinone, I think it's called a quinone, uh, which, is found, it's, which is part of the photosynthesis, uh, uh, a chemical used, chemical used in photosynthesis that exists mainly in rhubarb. So they've started calling it the rhubarb battery. Uh, and uh, they've already got working prototypes of this, and they're scaling it up now. And so what you're talking about is a sort of factory-sized installation that stores electricity on, on, at a gigawatt level, enough for a city. And that's what you're talking about. And then you can start to say, Wind turbines work because they're charging these things all the time. Solar panels work because they're charging these things all the time. You can start to envisage a world where we don't have to burn stuff to do the things we do. And that, that is really, uh, you know, that is the, the overarching, I wish to advocate that to be the overarching aim of, of the human race on the planet. Um, last year, Tesla... Uh, for example, the car company uh, ordered 2 billion battery cells from Panasonic for their cars, but also for grid storage. And this, just, this year, they've just announced a $5 billion investment in a gigafactory. Not a mega factory, <laughs> or a hyper factory, a gigafactory. The biggest factory in the world, uh, which will be producing batteries by the trillions. Um, and they are all, you know, they're, they're, they are absolutely aware that they're making batteries for their cars, but they're also making batteries for their uh, uh, charging system. So when you have a Tesla Model S like that, it has a huge battery. It's 85 kilowatt hour battery. That's enough to run a house for a week. And it has 7,000 uh, 18650 cells, which are the cells that you find in laptops. Uh, so there's 7,000 of them in the floor of that car. That's quite a lot. Uh, and so they take a lot of charging, and they can, you can charge that car in half an hour. That's a phenomenal amount of electricity you pump into it. But in order to do that, they need to, to be constantly taking electricity from their sources, which in America is mainly solar, and storing it in a battery. So they're using their batteries to charge their batteries. And you start to see a completely different picture emerging. If you buy a Tesla Model S, you can charge it on their fast chargers forever for nothing. That's one of the guarantees they give you. You don't have to pay for the, the electricity you're using. Uh, which, is, which a lot of people uh, are already doing in America. Um, uh, the other one that I really caught my attention, that I loved, was, uh, was air, uh, air pressure batteries, which I think, because I still, I'm trying to shift my thinking from an ever-ready battery with springs on the top to the different ideas that are coming up. So outside Toronto, there are tanks sunk into the water, concrete tanks, and now uh, poly, poly, poly something, poly, plastic, plastic bags that are full of air. And they pump air down when the electricity is cheap, and it, and it inflates the bag underwater. And of course, the bag is under enormous pressure because it's underwater. It's very, very simple. And when they want to take that power away, that is effectively a battery, they open a valve, and the air comes out under enormous pressure, runs a turbine, generates electricity. Very simple system. In theory, in practice, anything you put in the sea gets fucked up. Uh, <laughs> Um, I was recently at a, the installation of a, a tidal turbine in, uh, in between Isla and Jura in the Inner Hebrides. And it's amazing because there will be one of the biggest power stations in the country and you won't be able to see it, it's underwater. 
And it's, it is literally, they do look like windmills. They're enormous uh, pieces of machinery uh, that will be down there. And they run 23 hours a day. So the tide is running 12 hours, well, 11 and a quarter hours one way. Then it stops. And all the turbines stop. You see, they don't work for a quarter of an hour every 12 hours. They don't do anything. And then they start turning the other way when the tide goes the other way. And very strong tides uh, and an enormous amount of electricity that we don't see. And this country is blessed with the strongest tides anywhere in the world. We could put those all around our country. We wouldn't see one wind turbine, one solar panel, and we could power the whole country. We could do that. I don't think we will, but we could do that. <laughs> there are very strong forces ranged against that sort of thing. Um, uh, 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 Mazdar City. I'll talk about Mazdar City because that is extraordinary. Abu Dhabi. Um, and Mazdar City is, uh, is being built at the moment. It's pretty huge already. It is uh, uh, an experimental city, as opposed to one building, of, of completely sustainable uh, 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 city with that, that generates more power than it uses. So every building is built with power, uh, um, with a, oh, it's basically built of solar panels, the roofs are solar panels, the windows are all solar, there, there's a huge solar farm outside, it, it, it's supplying electricity uh, to, the, to old Abu Dhabi. Uh, it is a phenomenally well-built thing, the buildings inside are cool, they're cooled by um, solar reflectors that heat oil, that drive generators, that run refrigeration equipment, that cool the buildings, not air conditioning, but the actual fabric of the building is cool. Because I was interviewing a wonderful engineer in the, in the, out in the desert, it was 42 degrees centigrade, that was quite sticky and hot, I was embarrassed, I was sweaty, um, I wore a dark shirt in the hope that it wouldn't show, but what happened was I got salt, uh, salt stain marks all around my man boobs. Uh, it looked really embarrassing, we had to reshoot it because I washed it off with water, that's really not relevant, but it was... And a humiliating moment, and the man I was interviewing, NASA, was very lovely in his proper full robes, and he smelt so lovely, I actually moved myself downwind of him so that I could smell the lovely, sp he smelt gorgeous, I was just like that, as he was talking, ah. and he had, the, it was very confusing, because he was, uh, he'd studied marine engineering in Newcastle, so he was an Arab in the desert with a Geordie accent, which was quite, <laughs> quite confusing, and we did get him to say, oh, we're the lads, uh, on camera, which he did much better than me. Uh, <laughs> um, but that, uh, when you see the, the, the scale that that's done on, so that is uh, very hard for us to do with the infrastructure we have, but when you see that it's possible, that uh, when you see, you know, my, my 18 solar panels on my roof, they produce this much electricity, it's not enough for the whole house, da, 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 all that. When you see uh, 40 hectares of solar panels stretching off into the distance. You can't even see the far ones, it's in the haze, that, that generates so much electricity <laughs> that they have a real problem with what to do with it. And they have just installed uh, an area of about two square miles of solar energy in Abu Dhabi. They are now 100% solar powered. They can store that energy as, uh, as uh, heated salt, which is extraordinary. They store it in big tanks that are buried in the desert. Um, they're not really displacing anyone except a few goats. So they're in a very different position to us, but it is possible to, to do it. Uh, as NASA said to me, um, we're doing this so that we don't burn any more oil. They, they used to generate electricity by burning oil in, in, big, um, in big oil burning plants. And they said, we're doing this so that we can sell you the oil so we don't have to burn it, which was, I think, a, a note we should make, a mental note we should make of that. That sentence didn't come out right. We should make a mental note of that, I think is what I meant to say. Um, uh, so I'm sort of advocating batteries as an idea. And there's enormous amount of reasons why we shouldn't. You know, why, why everybody goes, oh, they're rubbish, they, they, they don't last, they don't work. And I just want to explain something about the, the Model S batteries, because of, uh, uh, and the same for all electric cars, but the Model S batteries, when it's new, 85 kilowatt hours, that battery will outlast that car. There's no way the car can stay a car. It will fall to bits long before that battery is worn out. And if you think that it reduces the range over that time, oh yeah, the range will be reduced and you'll have to replace the batteries and they're really expensive. The car, we now know, and I will, it, it, you know, there's so much evidence to support this, that the, the batteries will outlast the car. And after 15 years, when that car is just a, a tattered wreck, you take that battery out and it's probably only got 60 kilowatt hours of capacity left. It's rubbish, 60 kilowatt hours is enough to run a house for four or five days. So you reconfigure that battery, you then use it for a further 20 years in your house as a storage system, or in an office, or in a school, or in a hospital. Uh, and, and it has enormously long life. And once it really has reached a very, very low capacity, then you can expend a lot of energy 
recycling all the material in it. So you're not going to throw it away. It's far too valuable. And it takes a lot of energy to recycle them, but it's 96% of the material in those batteries can be reused and make a brand new battery that has the full capacity you started with. That is a very different proposition to the fuel we're burning now. There's one other point I just really want to make, because what I'm hoping is you'll ask questions, because I didn't want to do my sort of standard talk about electric cars, but I'm very happy to answer questions about anything that I've brought up, because I think that would be a more productive way of, of proceeding. That's really what I'm trying to do at the moment, is have an autonomous house. That's what I'm working towards. It's a difficult thing to negotiate with my wife, because apparently we've got to buy food. And all I want to do is buy batteries. Uh, uh, <laughs> and I'm actually now not allowed to say the word battery in the kitchen. I've been banned. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I'm, try I'm installing an, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, sort of ground-mounted solar panels this summer in my back garden without planning permission. Don't tell anyone, but no one else can see it. <laughs> I don't need planning permission. Uh, because, because once you've done that for a bit, I was very sceptical about solar panels. I thought this is the United Kingdom uh, or England or wherever we live. I never know what to call it, Great Britain. Some islands off the coast of Europe. Um, <laughs> because uh, it's cloudy and it rains and it's awful. Well, I, do, I generate about 3,500 kilowatt hours of electricity a year from my solar panels, and that is roughly the average consumption of a UK house. A semi-detached house uses between three and 4,000 kilowatt hours a year. So I'm generating what a, a house consumes. So if I can generate 10 times what a house consumes, I can then run a lot of batteries, store that electricity, run electric cars off it, uh, you know, change the way that we produce and consume electricity just on a small level. And, and we also want to install air source heat pumps, uh, 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 ground source heat pumps, all those sort of things. I can operate a digger, so I'm prepared to rip the garden up again. <laughs> Guess how popular that is in the kitchen. Um, <laughs> don't let him have a digger. He's a nutter. I have put in my own sewage pipes. It is a different experience. Can I just say this? When you have a crap in the morning and you flush and you know exactly where that poo is going. <laughs> it's a really fulfilling, I, every day, I, every day I have enormous, enormous bowel pleasure, because I know, <laughs> and it's never blocked up. I'm so proud of my sewers. I did have help. I've dug the trenches. I had help from a proper sewer man who said, that's not enough of a run. You want to get a better run. Get a better run in. So it really flows. And I can just, <laughs> and we've got a, a septic tank, and I can just, <laughs> oh, it's fabulous. I really wanted to do a talk about sewers, because I love sewers. <laughs> I went in the uh, sewers in London for a show called How Do They Do It? <laughs> how, do, how do they do it? <laughs> um, and it was just brilliant. And I, I just, this is very quick. I just want to tell you this, because I was so proud of this moment. Because I worked with a very roughy tufty cameraman. He also he does a lot of Top Gear, and he does a lot of sort of... He'll film Brian Cox standing on a volcano, but he'll be hanging out of the helicopter. You know, those shit when Brian Cox is going, It's amazing. And he's flying around, like hanging out of a helicopter with a bit of a strap, <laughs> absolutely no fear. He's so butch. And we went down in the sewers in London, which are stunning. They're amazing. And it's a tunnel that is literally that shape. So you're kind of, it's sort of human being shape. And you're sort of shin deep in mainly water. I'll be honest about it. It isn't like you're wading through shit. Every now and then something hits your shin and you go, mm. <laughs> You feel it going, boom, as it floats past. But we got down, and it was like a mile, it was a mile-long straight tunnel that just went into nothing. And he was ahead of me, with, and we had lights on, and we had all sorts of, we had breathing equipment and everything, and all the right kit on. And we, were with, we weren't just wandering around on our own. We had proper, <laughs> proper sewer blokes, who really should be the heroes of, of British culture. They are amazing guys. And uh, we were about, we'd gone so far, so we wanted it to be really dark so he could get a shot of me and then turn a the light on, and you see how dark it is. He freaked out. <laughs> so proud. I was fine. <laughs> He had some sort of terrible claustrophobic attack and just couldn't cope, and I had to carry his camera and all this stuff, and he was all shaky when I went out. I never let him forget it. Because <laughs> there's so many times I've been hanging on the top of a chimney or something like that, screaming and shaking in fear, and going, come on, let's get a shot, get it in. And he's leaning over, 800 metres up, windy, no safety railings. Oh. So, yes, that's sewers. Wonderful. Uh, oh, the, the, uh, the Evanpar, it's, I don't know how you pronounce it, the Evanpar uh, molten salt reflector in the Mojave Desert. Have you, anybody heard of that? That is amazing when you see that. That is terrifying. <laughs> that is a, uh, it's only opened last year. It is, uh, I don't know how many, thousands of reflective mirrors 
that reflect the, sun, the sunlight and condense it onto one point on a very tall tower. That heats molten salt up to a phenomenal temperature, which is stored. It runs 24-7. It, uh, it produces 377 megawatts of electricity. It's a very big installation. The only downside, which I think they're trying not to to uh, allow too much publicity, and there's not a lot of birds in the desert. It's important to point out it's a very rare occurrence, but if, if the birds fly between, <laughs> between the mirrors and the tower, they're just cooked like, like that. They're just instantly roast. You could stand at the bottom with a roast pan full of veg. <laughs> there we go. But it's happened like twice. It's not like there's crowds of birds. It's in the middle of the Mojave Desert. It's not like, you know, if you did it outside a wood in Kent, it might be a problem. <laughs> But I just love the idea of sort of pre-roasted birds dropping out of the sky. Oh, no, I don't love it. It'd be cruel and wrong. <laughs> I think it's wrong. Um, uh, so, yes, uh, there we go. I've, I've kind of done most of it. All I, all the only other things I w feel obliged to, to reveal is that uh, we are making an <laughs> another series of Red Dwarf uh, this year. Um, <laughs> um, uh, with the original cast, I'm not allowed to say Dad's Army in Space, but I have. Um, uh, we start in October. Uh, I'm making a series at the moment called Fully Charged, which I, maybe some of you have seen, where I kind of review electric vehicles. The Tesla one, if you want to see some beeped out swearing when I go around a roundabout in the Tesla Model S, that's on there. Um, uh, my favorite comment uh, underneath that is from an American who said, oh my God, you get in a Tesla and you go all potty mouth, which I thought was great. I love being a bit potty mouth. Um, <laughs> And I'm doing, uh, I used to do a series called Carpool, where I give uh, people a, a lift in the car and we interview them. And, I, and I, in fact, on the train yesterday, it was all confirmed, so I'm doing a new series of that uh, starting very soon. So there'll be lots of more carpools coming out. And just as a final little plug, outside there, there's a little bookstall, and there's three of my books there uh, that I'm very happy to sign. And I've done a, done a special promotional deal. <laughs> that I very much understand if you don't want to have anything to do with, uh, which is, um, I've got, I found some, genuinely found some Crichton photographs in my bag that were, I'd had in my bag for a science fiction convention I did last weekend. Um, if you want to, I can sign them, but you don't have to have them. If you buy a book, you can have a picture too, but only if you want to, you don't have to. <laughs> uh, but let me quickly tell you about the books, because they are relevant. So the, I'm writing a science fiction trilogy. Uh, which is set 200 years in the future in a world where they don't burn anything to do anything else. So a highly advanced technological society. Uh, uh, and the, the, the kind of basic notion of it was to be the antithesis of uh, all the apocalyptic uh, post-Armageddon zombie, um, you know, one man and a gun going to save his daughter uh, fiction that we're all very familiar with, which is brilliant. There's nothing wrong with it. I love it. Um, you know, uh, the sort of dystopian horror, everything's got to get worse. And uh, all my theories about it being a white male fear of, of uh, everything are r nonsense because women read and write as much uh, dystopian fiction as men. Uh, but I just thought uh, it would be nice to try and find an alternative. So it, the idea is that the world's actually better in 200 years uh, than it is now. And there's a lot of uh, t technology that I've witnessed in various research laboratories and material science laboratories in particular that I've kind of extrapolated and kind of put into the, into the world as normal stuff. Things like graphene and, and carb carbon fiber nanotubes and all these sort of weird things that just about exist now, but clearly would be very uh, life-changing if they did exist. Um, but I think I should shut up now. There's a timer somewhere that tells me to shut up. Oh, yeah. Right, no, I don't need to shut up. I could go on for hours. <laughs> but I think I'd, I'd quite like to go for questions. I mean, unless no one's got a question, in which case it would be deeply and profoundly embarrassing and I'll do some tap dancing. <laughs> but thankfully... Oh, yes, no, you're supposed to do that. Sorry, Paul, so I beg your pardon. Right, no, sorry, just, just a little reminder with the question and answer thing. Yeah. Please do come and use the microphone, oh, uh, form a queue sorry. there, and keep the questions brief and questions, not, not opinions or statements or anything worthwhile. Oh, that's clever. <laughs> I'll do my best. Uh, okay, um, I'm from Norway, and by the way, we are not exactly 100%. 98. But, yeah, okay, but still. Uh, geek and uh, OCD, you know. Uh, there's a company called Stordot that uses organic semiconductors to, uh, and they saw the prototype that uh, will recharge a smartphone in 30 seconds. Yeah. Uh, which shows that your bit of a dick friend, which is huge brick mobile phone, we are there now with our smartphones. And what are your thoughts about this concern with uh, this huge battery factories? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, I mean, the, the, the obvious thing is that 
for instance, let's just mention Clarkson just for a moment. I, I generally try not to, but he's lovely. Um, that his opinions on electric vehicles are totally valid and completely grounded in reality in about 1995. <laughs> and, and that's the only problem. So in 1995, they didn't go very far. The batteries did wear out. They had to be thrown away. You, you know, they were just... But we don't, we don't, we're not in 1995. And what's happened in that intervening period is a phenomenal amount of technological development. And things like, I mean, I think, you know, I'm old, but well within my lifetime, you will literally be able to drive an electric car over a plate that's sunk into the road, and it will recharge them. You won't even know, you won't even think recharging, you'll just have a car that goes along the road. And it will recharge in a few seconds, not hours. And so all that stuff is absolutely on the horizon. It already technically exists. In case you don't know about that, the induction charging is an extraordinary uh, piece of new technology. It's being used in Formula E, uh, which is the new uh, racing formula that starts in uh, September this year. Uh, it's used by a man called Paul Drayson, who set the world land speed record for an electric car last year. Uh, you, you don't plug, there's nowhere to plug that car in. You literally park it over a plate that's in the road and it charges through that, and it charges very fast through that. So all those uh, uh, issues that exist now, like I live in a flat and I've got nowhere to, park, to charge my car, are completely legitimate and reasonable things. <laughs> you know, excuse, yes, I, I'd like an electric car, but I can't have one because I live in an apartment. Of course, you know, it's difficult at the moment. Only 60% of uh, households in the UK have off-street parking. And as someone said in the wonderful film, Who Killed the Electric Car? Electric cars are only suitable for about 90% of the population, <laughs> which I think was a very good line. Uh, so that, so the technology of things like the, uh, it was in the news recently, a, a, a mobile phone that charges in a second, is, is so going to happen. <laughs> There's nothing we can do about it. Really. If we don't want it, it's too bad. It is going to happen. So. Uh, you know, it's a, it is a very exciting time, and it does change. It change. I think that's really what I've, I feel I've failed to, to convey, and what I was trying to convey is that these changes are coming very rapidly, and they will change the entire spectrum, and they are a huge challenge to people like the, the coal industry and coal-powered uh, uh, electricity generation, and they are moody. In Germany, for instance, they're in a really bad mood and they, because they don't, they don't use very much of it, and they're moving out, and they're moving to other countries where they can still dig coal up and burn it. Uh, you know, so there's going to be a big upset, and it does change a lot of different industries. I'll shut up now. I'll ask another question. <laughs> Thank you. So you're obviously a big fan of um, hydro and, and solar and wind, wind uh, energy. What are your thoughts on nuclear power? Uh, very conflicted, um, uh, because I think it's probably has to be inevitably we have to have it. Uh, I think the, the costings and the power structures that are inherent within nuclear power the, the, it's almost the politics more than the technology that, I, I, that I'm uncomfortable with. I, I would happily have a nuclear power station in my back garden. They're really safe. They're, 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 if you look at the safety record of nuclear power, it's phenomenally good, even, even including disasters. Um, it, it is extraordinarily uh, safe technology. I would be very unhappy about having a long-term nuclear waste storage uh, facility in my back garden. That would make me much more uncomfortable. Um, uh, and so there are, I think there are huge problems with it. But the, I think for me, the main one is the, the fact that you've got a centralized, very uh, a centralized system that requires huge investment and therefore huge corporate control and therefore huge uh, political leverage uh, that you're giving a very small select group, the 1%, enormous power. And I think one of the exciting things uh, uh, about the, the, the technological developments around that are localized, uh, locally owned, localized, widely distributed power generation. And it is things like, I don't know if you know about Balkham, Balkham Village, where the demonstrations were against fracking last year. The village has decided to go 100% renewable. That's the villages who live there. Not, it's not, not me and my, uh, as uh, Clarkson would call them, me and my beardy, weirdy, sandal-wearing, tofu-eating mates that have done that. It's, it's ordinary people in villages. I live in a village, and, most, and we're doing, trying to do exactly the same thing in my village. And it's, it's not easy, but it is possible. And I've just been pitching the idea that we've got an old water mill in the village uh, to put a water turbine in that and solar panels on the old playing field that isn't used anymore, that's just scrub land. And the, the difference, I think if I'd suggested that 10 years ago, it would have been all the posh uh, retired colonels that live in our village would have gone, it's absolute poppycock. And now they're going, it's actually a really bloody good idea. Have you heard what I was doing? We put the solar panels there. The water turbine, marvellous. You know, so there is a sort of change. in, And what that would mean is our village produces all its electricity and sells it to the grid. 
and produces all our own electricity. And uh, the economic arguments are phenomenal. And the economic arguments for the, the latest uh, announcement for the nuclear power station are on such a gargantuan scale and over such a long period of time that, I mean, it's not even going to come online until 2025, I think. The, the, you know, and and that's, uh, that makes me worried. And essentially, you still need to dig up fuel to burn it. And there are, obviously, there's a lot of arguments, and I get, uh, uh, if I ever mention nuclear power, and I'm not negative about it, because I think it is a much better choice than burning coal. <laughs> it's my, I'd much prefer to see that. But if I ever mention it on Twitter, then I get a huge amount. You know, once we've got fusion, everything will be fine, which is in a similar way to once we've got hydrogen fuel cell cars, everything will be, that will be the future. You know, well, I've been waiting for hydrogen fuel cell cars since 1971, I think, and I'm, uh, I'm getting a bit bored. <laughs> but I still hope I'm wrong. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, photovoltaics, um, concentrated solar power, and um, uh, tidal turbines. Are there any new forms of uh, power generation coming online, kind of in the future, in our lifetimes, that you know about through your engineer chums that kind of might surprise us? I mean, the one that I've just seen is, is and I'm going to use not quite the right terms because I can't remember the exact terms, but it is, um, it is concentrated photovoltaic so it was an array of of uh, of movable um, uh, 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 I'm going to try and describe it in a really clear way uh, it's a tiny little chip that is exactly the same as that there is on a solar panel but it has lenses above it and the, the 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 rig that it's set in moves with the sun so it's computer controlled and so it actually does turn as the sun goes across the sky and it is phenomenally more efficient than, than a, a, a flat solar panel very very lightweight um, I've just seen an array that is designed to charge electric taxis in London. So they will be on the roofs of these uh, taxi charging bays very soon in London. And uh, in one year, they've produced, I think it's 14 megawatts, which is just off the scale. And this is not a terribly big thing. It's enough. It covers an area that, that you can park five taxis in. So it's not like a, uh, it's not that vast. It's, it's much more. Just need to knock up in three minutes. Have I? No, what? you've got about three minutes left. Oh, have I? oh good. Oh, good. I no, not good. I mean, I don't mean that, but I was really worried I hadn't said anything. I've said a lot of old bollocks. Anyway, yes, yeah, so that one was the one that I was very impressed with. So it still is, it is a salt, but this is, I want to remind you, this is in this country. This is in cloudy, damp, dull, cold, miserable, off the coast of Europe, little island. Yes, sorry. <laughs> So you've talked about these two very different uh, ways of generating renewable energy, like your solar panels on top of your house and then these big centralized solar panels in the desert somewhere. Do you think this is has, you kind of have to pick one way and invest in this, either the local or the centralized, or is it like complementary or you have to do both? I think it's got to be complementary. I mean, I think, because uh, I love comparing the German model with the French model. So I've driven through France in an electric car and you know that 99% of the electricity that you're using is from nuclear power stations. They have more nuclear power stations than anyone else. Amazing system. It, it's, you know, they sell electricity to us. Often our electricity is up to 10, 10 or 15% from France uh, in this country, so it's nuclear. And then you go into Germany, uh, where they are uh, on particular days in the year now up to over 50% of their electricity is renewable. And that is because it's w massively widely distributed. Every, we, we did I spy as we went down the Autobahn looking for the houses that don't have solar panels on the roof. And you can see them, but they're very rare. And there are just such a huge amount of wind and there's such a huge amount of... Uh, and that, they've been investing in that for the last 25 years. And it's paying off now, and they're having now they're having problems with coal and, and the industries that, that are being uh, having their noses put out of joint. So I think it's got to be both. So there are extraordinary, huge plans to cover, you know, many square miles of the Sahara Desert uh, with with solar generating, which obviously is a very good place to do it, and then transporting that electricity up into Europe and into the European grid. And it would mean that. Uh, 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 you know, a, an African country was our chief energy supplier, which is, in a sense, you know, it just shifted a bit. But uh, one of the, the key things I wanted to quickly say, which isn't directly related to that, but is the amount of electricity we use to refine crude oil, uh, which is phenomenal. Uh, and the figures are now very closely kept secret from us. But up until 2005, the, the uh, United Nations Data Statistics Department had access to those figures. And in 2005, it was 4,600 gigawatt hours a year this country uses to, uh, to refine oil. So we use an enormous amount of electricity in our oil refining, which is never put in the, in the figures for what comes out of a tailpipe of a car. So it's a lot more. So 
But yes, I think. <laughs> sorry, I'm, I've got to stop. The, the, the gentleman's been queued okay, for a long time. One so more. Can, can we I'll have, do a really um, quick answer. Sorry. Uh, the, the answer in not more than twelve words. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it should be a quick one. I hope this. Is, I hope it's not a Jeremy Clarkson question, but. I've heard there's a problem with electric cars in a country like this in that you use a lot of energy to heat the car because obviously with a combustion engine you get yeah. free heat, or, you know, so... Yeah. I just um, uh, you're absolutely right. My, my Nissan Leaf is the first generation and it has a, a heater that is a, a, a heated electric element like a blow fan heater that we used to have in our student bedrooms. Even though I wasn't a student, I had one of those fan heaters. Very, very inefficient use of the electricity. Uh, does sap the battery. I lose about 10 miles range if I switch the heater on in the winter. Really bad. I've got really warm clothes and, and, uh, and, I, and, and the, you know, the window's messed up. Later models of vehicles have heat exchangers. Uh, massively more efficient, use a tenth of the energy. When you switch the, the heating on in a, a new Nissan Leaf, the range, some, you can't even see it drop, but sometimes it drops by a mile if it's very, very cold. So uh, in January this year, I drove from London to Edinburgh in a day in a Nissan Leaf with the heater on, uh, uh, stopping at rapid charges all the way up. Um, got slagged off in the sun by Jeremy Clarkson, result. Uh, and, um, uh, and we had the heater on all the time, drove at, at motorway speeds, which means over 80 miles an hour all the way, because that's how fast people drive. We were constantly, we were doing 80, 85, constantly being overtaken by white vans. It is against the law, and it should be banned, absolutely. People, there should be a 50-mile-an-hour speed limit. I wish there was. Um, uh, and, uh, and it was boring. That was the main thing. It was boring, driving that far. Uh, it would be much better to get a train uh, and read a book, which is what I did to get here, which is lovely. And I'll shut up now. That was more than 12 <laughs> words. <laughs> Thank you very much. Robert Llewellyn, ladies and gentlemen.